Thank you very much for that today. You may be seated. What a great joy to hear those songs and to be able to participate in worship this morning. If you have your copy of God's Word today, we're going to reside in the Old Testament book of Psalms today. Psalms chapter 3. So we'll look at the third psalm. We are in between studies right now because we finished up the book of Ruth around Christmas time, and uh, soon we'll begin the book of 1 Samuel, probably next week, Lord willing. So we're kind of in between studies, and we've been looking at some topical messages. And today from Psalm chapter 3, we're going to look at a message entitled, Just Keep Trusting. Just Keep Trusting. We have... um, an inauguration this week of a new president, and we all have probably some concerns about the unrest that we saw in our nation's capital over the last uh, couple of weeks, and it just leaves us uh, standing um, speechless uh, when we see those kind of acts of violence portrayed, uh, just as it was back in the summer when we saw the riots in the streets of some of the largest cities in our country. There's never a place for that, never a proper time for that. And uh, it leaves us all concerned. Sometimes it seems as though the problems in life are so large, how can you get your arms around it? How can you, how can you raise your children in a world that is, seems to be crumbling around us and give them hope and give them assurance and to give them comfort? And we just have to continue to remind ourselves and to remind our children and remind our family that what we're seeing is really nothing new in the scope of human history. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, man has been at enmity with man, and man has been at enmity with God, and the result of that is always conflict. But in the midst of conflict and struggles and pressures of life, we have to do what we can, and that is to simply continue to trust. So I'm, and I mean trust in God with everything that we have. So today we're going to look at this, uh, Psalm chapter 3, just keep trusting. Do you know Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble? Job said, man that is born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. So it is part of all of our lives, troubles and heartache and conflict, and we have to know how to navigate through all of the disappointments and the uncertainties of life. And the way we do that is to firmly fix our eyes on the Lord, and with all that we have and all that we are, we just continue to trust Him. So let's read Psalm chapter 3. You'll notice there's a superscription at the beginning of the psalm, or a title that says this, A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah means to pause, meditate on that. Verse 3, but thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid down and slept. I awake, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone and hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Thy blessing is upon thy people, Selah. So may God add his blessings today as we look at Just Keep Trusting. Psalm chapter 3 is known as a psalm of firsts. A psalm of first. This is the first of 73 psalms written by King David. This is the first psalm that uses that little um, word selah. It is a musical term that means to stop, to pause, to meditate on it. You find it three different times. Verse number one, verse number four, and then again in verse number eight. It is also the first psalm that's a cry for help. And then it is also the first psalm that has that little title or that little superscription above verse number one. In fact, one commentator said about that superscription these words, the title is like a key hanging at the door ready to open it and to let us in. So really the superscription tells us the context for uh, the environment in which David writes Psalm uh, chapter three. And he does so 
according to a time when the Bible says that he is running for his life from his own son, Absalom. And you read that and you think, well, why in the world would David's son be after him? Why would he need to run from his son? Well, I told you that I've been reading through the books of First and Second Samuel in preparation for our studies through that that we'll try to start next week, Lord willing. And you will find the life of David recorded there in First and Second Samuel. You'll find this story of Absalom's betrayal. And if you remember Absalom, the Bible says that he had hair that was so thick and dark that it looked like raven's feathers. Uh, and, uh, and he was a handsome guy. And, um, and that there was a time when he challenged David for the throne. So you think, well, why would he be after his father? Why is he wanting to, to uh, throw his father off the throne? 1 Samuel shares all of that information with us, and we'll look at it as, uh, as it unfolds in weeks to come. But what had happened basically was this. Absalom had stolen the hearts of the people of Israel. Absalom decided he wanted to be king, and he was going to dethrone his dad and everybody that he could get to be disloyal to David and become loyal to him. Absalom was more than happy to bring them in his camp. So Absalom pieces together a very strong conspiracy. And David knows the only way he can survive this is to get out of Jerusalem. So that's what he does. He gets his family together, the family that's still loyal to him, small though it may be, and the small group of people that are still loyal to him. And he says, we've got to go. They pack up all their possessions. Now remember, this is the king, for heaven's sakes. He says, we've got to go. There is a coup d'etat ready to take place here. So they all pack up, and they're leaving Jerusalem. And then in 1 Samuel 15, the Bible tells us this, gives us this image. Uh, David is walking through the desert having left Jerusalem, and he is a mess. The Bible pictures him as having his head covered, having his face to the ground in shame. He is weeping copious tears. He is barefoot, and as he walks through the desert, a guy comes up out of nowhere who was loyal to the former king, King Saul. The guy's name is Shimei, and he begins to throw rocks at David and to curse him and to tell him what a low life he was. And David didn't even know this guy. And I read that and I'm thinking, you know, that's just the way trouble comes in our lives. It seems as though you have one problem and then in, in a short time there's another one that comes right behind it. Have you ever noticed that? And it's like a wave of a series of problems or difficulties or troubles. And then you have a little respite of peace and tranquility. And then you think, oh Lord, here it goes again. It's going to start again. But for whatever reason, the devil orchestrates it that way. We have Problem after problem after problem. And then he might have a little time of, of ease, and then it'll start over again. David, in his mind, he's lost the throne. He's walking through the desert, head covered, weeping, barefoot. And a guy comes out of nowhere throwing rocks. A guy comes out of nowhere hurling insults and uh, humiliating David even to a greater degree than what he had already experienced. And uh, David, it's probably the most humiliating time in his life. The king, but what kind of king is walking barefoot through a desert dodging rocks from some stranger who's cursing at him with every breath that he has? Well, uh, David was really struggling, and he was going through a time of great difficulty. He was emotionally injured by the betrayal of his son Absalom. Do you know the name Absalom means, my father is peace, but David had very little peace in his life. When he was a teenager, he was anointed to be the next king of Israel. But it would be years before he would actually take the throne. As this teenager, he had to go face Goliath in a battle. Although David won that battle, and God won the battle for him, imagine how intimidating it must be to go up against a guy who was over nine feet tall, weighing over 500 pounds, when David was probably at best 5'6", five, 5'7", five, weighing about 130 pounds. How intimidating that must have been. So David didn't really have any peace there. For four years, he ran from King Saul because Saul knew that David would be his replacement. In fact, on two different occasions, the Bible says that Saul tried to pin David to the wall with a spear. So for four years, he's running from his life from King Saul, and now lo and behold, he's running from his own son, Absalom. The backwash 
of the sin of David's life started from this event. He had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba. He saw her bathing as he was on the rooftop when he should have been out to battle with the kings. And he had an affair with her. Then he had her husband killed. The result of of all of his sinfulness was the birth of a child who died uh, immediately after it was born. And David was so distraught. And the backwash of all of that, God said to David that the sword would never depart from his house. And it didn't. And although Absalom's name means my father is peace, David could find no peace. Let me illustrate. Absalom had an older brother named Amnon. Amnon violated his sister Tamar. uh, Absalom was so angry toward Amnon that Absalom killed him. So you can just see David's family that had really, really quickly dissolved into chaos as a result of, of his own bad decisions. For the next two years, Absalom ran and lived in Syria only to come back, and now he's going to challenge David for the throne. And during this time, this two-year period, Absalom steals the heart of the people. He betrays his own dad and leaves his dad in a time of tremendous crisis. So that's the first thing I want you to see, is David's time of crisis. Look in verse number one. Lord, how are they increased that troubled me? Many are they that rise up against me. Look at the word trouble. It comes from a Hebrew word that means literally the crowding of an adversary. It means to be in a narrow or tight place. Distress is the picture. Anguish is the picture. Remember, step back, where is David during this time walking through that desert with a, with a rag on his head, weeping barefoot, getting rocks thrown at him and getting cursed a blue streak? And he says, Lord, why in the world are there so many that are against me? And people who are against me seem to be increasing. Absalom had gained a following from people who were disillusioned with David, and now they are hunting him like a shark that smells blood in the water. And David takes out the pen and he said, Lord, why are they increasing in number? And it seems like my kingdom is slipping away from my hands and more and more people becoming loyal to Absalom. He was going through a time of great crisis. Listen to what he says in Psalm 13. How long will you forget me, O Lord? Have you ever felt like that? In a time of personal crisis, Lord, how long are you going to leave me here? And let me go through this. He writes, how long will you forget me, O Lord, forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart every day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? In other words, David just felt helpless. God, how long are you going to let it continue like this? Listen to Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters that are come into my soul. I sink deep in mire where there is no standing. I am come into the waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for God. They that hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. Now that's a man in a time of crisis. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree? Lord, the enemies have so increased that I've got more enemies than I do friends. And the enemies are more than the hair of my head. That was a crisis. Sooner or later, everyone will go through a crisis. No one escapes trouble. As a pastor, I can't begin to tell you the time that I have been with people in times of crisis that would just break your heart. I remember I was actually visiting with one of my deacons in another church that I served, and he began to open up and pour his heart out to me about a hurt that he had carried for so many years. And he began to tell me the story, how he came home from work one day, and his son, who was 10 or 11 years old, something like that, was out in the backyard playing. And when it was supper time, and they were calling for him, he didn't come. And they go to the backyard and they find that his son had accidentally gotten tangled in the swing set and had had hanged himself. And he said, Pastor Darrell, I've never, I've never been able to get over that. And as long as I live, he said, I'll never forget that image and I'll never be able to erase that from my mind. 
I would say that is a crisis of epic proportion, wouldn't you? And you think that would leave such an injury and such a scar that you could never be made whole again? Maybe your crisis, or I certainly hope not, and mine will not be to that extreme. But everybody will have crises coming into our lives. And when those crises come, there are some times that we can't change it, we can't remove it, we can't fix it. But all we can do is just trust God. And I don't mean to say that flippantly as if that's the only thing you can do, but isn't that true when it really gets right down to it? The only thing you can do sometimes is just trust God. You can't fix the circumstance, the situations, or if it's an individual, you just have to put your eyes on the Lord, focus on Him, and with all you have, say, God, I'm going to trust you through this. I'm going to trust you through this. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the name Louis Giglio. Uh, Louis Giglio is probably one of the most popular pastors in America uh, today. He pastors Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Started the Passion Movement that's kind of swept across our country over the course of the last number of years. Louis Giglio... And you can, you can uh, go to YouTube and you can see his personal testimony there. But even as a pastor, he talks about his uh, time and his, his time of crisis of dealing with anxiety and dealing with depression. And he said it's just like he fell into a hole and he couldn't climb out of that hole. And every Sunday he gives people hope. But now he finds himself in this hole that he just can't seem to get out of. He's written a book called Comeback where he talks about some of those events. But in another book he's written, it's called Goliath Must Fall. And he talks about his own personal crisis with depression and anxiety. And this is what he says. Quote, the problem is that most, most of us know that in and of our own strength, we cannot defeat these giants that are in our lives. Ask anyone who has struggled with rejection. Ask anyone who has struggled with anger or struggled with fear and anxiety and depression. A lot of people have been around the block dozens of times trying to make changes, but yet the giant is still there. The beauty in the book is that we're not David in the story of David and Goliath. From our perspective, Jesus, listen to this, Jesus is the giant slayer in the story. Jesus is David in the story of David and Goliath, and he takes down the giants on our behalf. And so we just learn to walk in what he has already done for us, end of quote. And I find that so powerful because there are times that we just can't fix situations. They're outside our control, but all we can do is trust and depend upon God, and lean on Him to come through for us. That's David's crisis. He is exhausted at this point in his life. He is discouraged. His troubles have overwhelmed him. He's living in heartache and tragedy. And he begins to pour out his heart to God and said, Lord, why are all of my enemies increasing in number? In fact, if you go to verse number 2, he says, many there be which say of my soul. That's twice that he uses that word many. Many are they that rise up against me in verse 1. Many are they which say of my soul. Look at this. There is no help from God in him. One translation says it just that way. God will not deliver him. Listen. The people who were disloyal and had turned their back on David believed that God also turned his back on David. But what they didn't realize is that God is not f as fickle as their pseudo-loyalty and that God would never turn his back. God had called David, sent Samuel to anoint him with oil and had already given them the throne years before Saul would come off the throne. God knew exactly what he was doing. God would say that he would never walk out on David and he'll never walk out on you. There'll be times in our lives when you'll be misunderstood, yes. There'll be times in your life when your motives are questioned. There'll be times in your life when you're treated unfairly, yes, maybe at work, and things just did not work out like you thought they were supposed to, or somebody did something to sabotage what you were about, or said something against your character, or uh, brought some kind of an accusation against you. There will be times of crises in everybody's life, and those are defining moments in our lives because I really believe that crises give us another opportunity to know God in a deeper way. Isn't it true if you never had any problems, we wouldn't know that God's a great problem solver, right? Isn't it true that if we never had any trouble, that we would never know that God is the one that we can come to in our times of trouble, that we can find rest and peace and comfort and courage to move on? 
You see, David's own people pledged their loyalty to Absalom. And Absalom's heart was prideful. Absalom's heart was, was against God. In fact, if you read through Samuel, and we'll cover this in our, in our studies through this, if you remember Absalom's demise, I told you he had a big head of hair like raven's feathers. He's riding his horse through the woods, and that hair gets caught up in the tree limb, and Absalom dies there. And David takes no pleasure in the death of his son. In fact, he says, oh, Absalom, Absalom, my own son, who has now died, and David is brokenhearted over that. But his crisis would give him an opportunity to know God in a deeper way. One writer, anonymous writer, says this, <clears throat> when sorrowful because everything fails to satisfy your soul, come to Christ because he is comfort and reassurance. When troubled because facing the truth is harder than life, come to Christ and be set free from worldly fears. When tempted because the evil one has found a foothold, come to Christ who saves the repentant sinner. When forgetful because nothing stays in an occupied mind, come to Christ the one who holds all things in his hands. When stressed because what was safe has grown insecure, come to Christ for his love will soothe and his love will satisfy. In this time of crisis, head covered, feet bare, Weeping copious tears, going through the desert, dodging rocks, listening to the insults heard, uh, hurled his direction by Shimei. David in his crisis said, why have my enemies increased? They're like the hair of my head. Why do they continue to grow? And now I want you to see how his time of increase has moved to a time of comfort. Look in verse number three. But thou, O Lord, and I love this verse, Thou, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. This psalm, I am told, is used sometimes by Israeli soldiers. It is a battle cry. And going to battle or going to war, but thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. What does a shield do? Well, a shield is a protector, right? And the psalmist would say, God, you're like my shield. And though those enemies are increased in number more than the hairs of my head, Lord, to get to me, they've got to come through you. It's really what Jesus was talking about in the Gospel of John when he talked about uh, himself being the good shepherd. He said, we're the sheep and he is the good shepherd. And he says, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And he says in that story, Jesus says, I am the door to the sheepfold. And what he was referencing is this, when shepherds cared for sheep and as they were tending those flock out in the, those arid regions of Palestine, they would erect maybe an ad hoc fence that would make almost a complete circle. And then at night, they would scurry those sheep into that fence that did not have a gate, it did not have a door, but once they got all the sheep inside that protective circular fence, the shepherd would lay down across the threshold of the doorway of that fenced-in area as a way to protect the sheep. And if a wolf or a wild animal tried to get to the sheep at night, in order to get to the sheep, he had to come through the shepherd. And that's what Jesus said, I am the door to the sheepfold. I am your protector. I am your shield. That's what David was referencing here. Though his enemies are increasing in number, though he has lost the throne in his thinking, Though he is resigned to live the life of a vagabond out in the desert and run for his life, he says, but God, all I know to do is just trust you. So God, you are my shield, and I'm going to put my trust in you. Look at the next thing he says about God. He says, you're my glory, look at this, and the lifter up of my head. That phrase the lifter up of my head is a metaphor for encouragement. God, you are my encouragement. It means restoration to one's former place. Do you know when we get down, when we get discouraged, you can see it in our body language, can you not? Because usually if we're defeated, if we're discouraged, if we're down about something, our head is going to be hanging down, right? Shoulders kind of slumped with kind of a depressed look on your face. I remember when my boys used to play ball, uh, and, and maybe they fouled somebody that wasn't a good foul, or they made a turnover or something like that, and they'd walk back to the bench with their head down, you know, kind of embarrassed or kind of ashamed. And then after the game, Tina and I would always say to them, guys, just keep your head up. 
Just keep your head up and playing, and you're never, you're, you're never beat until you quit. Just keep your head up and just keep moving forward and keep pressing forward and just do the best you can. David said, walking through this desert land, his head's down, his shoulders are down, he's weeping, and he said, but God, you're such a shield to me, I'm going to put my trust in you. And he said, Lord, you encourage me by, and I love that imagery, you lift up my head, and God, you're saying to me, David, keep your chin up. David, keep your head up. Sure, there's rocks being thrown. Sure, there's trouble all around you. Sure, the circumstances look kind of bleak. Keep your head up and keep moving forward and keep moving forward and keep moving forward. You see, when your, your head's down, it's kind of a sign of defeat, isn't it? But God comes in his grace and he lifts up our head. When we were in, uh, in Ecuador a number of years ago on a mission trip, uh, we had an opportunity to help build a little church uh, out um, out in the middle, I, I would tell you it was the middle of nowhere, but I think it's even beyond the middle of nowhere. It is nowhere. And um, we were uh, on a mountainside with just sheer mountains that you just wouldn't believe the, how steep they were. And the little church we were building, I remember above it um, was, a, was a boulder hanging out of, the, hanging out of the, uh, the hillside that looked like it was as large as this auditorium. And uh, you could see skid marks down in the valley where other large boulders like that had kind of rolled and eventually come to rest. I thought, Lord, please just keep that rock there just a little while longer while we're working on this, while we're working on this church. But when we, got, when we did, did some of the work on the church, they asked us one of the days that we were there to do a little dedication for the service and, and for me to share some remarks and to kind of put together a service, and we weren't prepared to that. And I remember <laughs> I laugh about this because Eric and Ann and their family was with us, and, uh, and I asked, uh, I told them, I said, they want us to do something for the service. Can y'all do a stick drama? And they didn't have any sticks. We were in Ecuador, right? I mean, they had them back, I guess, on the bus or wherever we were staying, but they didn't have them with us at the church. They didn't know we were going to do anything. And they go to the cornfield, if I remember correctly, and you cut down some corn stalks. Isn't that right? Is that what, I was, what it was? Uh, to use as sticks for the stick drama. And I remember asking Randy uh, Joyce if he would share uh, a, a word and a devotional before I brought the message. And his son Drew was going to translate. And of course, you know, Randy, we were, at, we were actually digging with shovels when I asked Randy if he would do that. And he, he just stopped and his eyes like, looked like a deer in a headlight. And uh, he said, yeah, he said, I'll do something. And he got his, new his, uh, his Bible and he started going through the Bible to see what God had put on his heart to share. And he shared a passage from Psalm 121 that I've always Remembered, and it said this, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. And isn't that a great passage? You get down, you get discouraged, you get depressed. The circumstances dump their entire ugly load on you, and your whole body language spells defeat. And God just comes and he just lifts up your head when you can look to him and lift up your eyes to those hills from whence comes our help. Our help really is in the Lord, and you just got to keep trusting and keep believing and keep following him. Listen, one man writes this, All the water in the world, however hard it tried, could never, never sink a ship unless it got inside. All the hardships of this world might wear you pretty thin, but they won't hurt you one little bit unless you let them in. David, in his time of crisis, thought it was all over. But in his moment of comfort, said, God, I'm going to trust you because you're my shield. I'm going to trust you because you're my glory. I'm going to trust you because you are the lifter up of my head. And you say to me through the thick and the thin of life, keep your head up. Keep your head up. You're a child of the king. Well, now look at David's time of confession. Look in verse number four. He said, I cried to the Lord with my voice. And he heard me, and out, uh, he heard me out of his holy hill, a uh, selah. Again, it means to pause and to meditate on it. He said, I laid me down and slept. I awake for the Lord sustained me. In fact, this is known as the morning psalm. I woke up, and the Lord sustained me. If you'll go, go down, drop down to chapter 4, look in verse number 8. It's known as the evening psalm. I will both lay down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only make me dwell in safety. So David says, whether I'm awake or whether I'm asleep, God, I know that you're right there with me and that you're my protector, you're my shield. 
You're the lifter up of my head. The story is told about the early American Indians who had a unique way of training their young braves. When an Indian boy became 13 years of age, they would, uh, on his 13th birthday, after he had learned a few skills of hunting and fishing and survival techniques, they would take this young teenage boy out into the middle of the woods at night, blindfolded completely so he doesn't know where he is, leave him in a position where he is disoriented, and then leave him there by himself all night long. And that young boy had never been away from the family, never been away from the tribe, and suddenly he would find himself in the middle of nowhere, pitch black at night, he would remove this blindfold and find no help anywhere around him. Every snap of a twig or every rustle of the breeze going through the bushes, he would think that it was just another animal ready to pounce on him. And it would be the longest night of that little brave's life, perhaps. But as morning came, and those sun rays began to illuminate the forest floor, and, those, and, and, the, and the dark shadows began to, to, to retreat, he could begin to see some trees, and some flowers, and some plants, and bushes. And as he looked over to his side, lo and behold, to his amazement, there stood his father, armed with a bow and arrow, who had stood beside him or next to him all night long. And the little boy had never even known that his protector was right there with him. That's the way it is when we're going through troubles. We just keep trusting. Because whether we know it or not, whether we realize it or not, I want you to know our great God stands right by us as our protector, as our shield, as the one whom the Scripture says is the lifter up of our head. Listen to what Romans 8 says. What can separate us from the love of God? I preached about this a few weeks ago. If God is for us, who is against us? What can separate us from the love of God? And then he gives us that long list, height, depth, of course not. Angels, principalities, powers, life, death, nothing, he says, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Look in verse number six, again, about his confession. He says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me round about. Now, what was he saying before? Why have my enemies so increased? Why are there so many of them? They're like more than the hairs of my head. But now he comes to this place where he said, but I'm just going to trust, so I'm not going to be afraid if there are 10,000 that have have risen up against me, that are going to support Absalom, that are going to follow Absalom. I'm just going to continue. So in our times of crisis, it's an old saying, but it is so true, we can either toss and turn at night trying to count sheep or we can just count on the shepherd and we trust him with all those things that are outside our control all those things we can't fix David's world was crumbling around him lost his throne lost part of his family lost his honor lost much of his dignity as he's running from cave to cave to cave to cave to try to uh, stay safe from his son Absalom he felt like he had left lost it all And maybe you have felt like that in the past, or maybe there'll be a day when you will feel like that. Or you might feel like that right now this morning, that good friends have betrayed you, that your work didn't happen the way you thought it was going to, or situations in life have left you kind of disillusioned. Rest and trust in God. He never sleeps, the Bible says. He never slumbers. He is always there to lift up our head. Look in verse number 7 as we bring this to a close. I told you this was, a, was, was sometimes used as a battle cry for Israeli soldiers. Look at that word, arise. Arise. It's a, an expression that was a call to action. Call to action. It means get up. Let's get at it. Lord, save me, he says. Oh, my God, you have smitten all of my enemies up on the cheekbone. You have broken out the teeth of the ungodly, which is just another way of saying you had defeated all of my enemies. And, and really, isn't that true for us? God goes before us and he fixes what we can't fix. He takes care of the situations that we can't take care of. And our role is to trust him. Just trust him. Just trust him. Just trust him. Look in verse 8. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Thy blessing is upon, uh, is upon thy people Selah. 
Remember as we started this service, I said to you, the words of Jesus, in this world you'll have trouble. And that is so true. In this world, your body language one day will say, I'm defeated, I'm discouraged. It's okay to go through times like that, but let's not stay there. Let God be the lifter up of your head. And as he says to you, keep your head up. Keep your chin up. Just keep serving, keep trusting, keep moving forward. And you'll find in a little while that that crisis that we thought was going to break us really did help us know God better and depend on him more. In fact, when you look back across your life and you see all the places that God led you through, what that does for me is it build a, builds a greater confidence. I'll just say this as I close. When I was a young preacher, I used to worry, Lord, maybe there'll be a day when, when I quit the ministry. or There might be a day, what if, what if this happens and I don't continue? I don't want to be a quitter and I don't want to give up. But now when I look back on it, I see all the, all the things that God has been so faithful to lead me through and to walk with me through that it gives me such great courage and great confidence that I'm like David. Now, I'm, not, I'm no super saint. Don't get me wrong. I want to say like David. Man, it doesn't matter if 10,000 come against me. It's all right. Or the problems are magnified. It's all right. Because God's my shield, right, church? God's my protector. God is the lifter up of my head. So trust him. Trust him. And let come what may, and God will be there with you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace, for the beauty of your word, and the majesty of your holiness. As we have this time of invitation, Lord, we just make the appeal, if there's one under the sound of my voice that has never come to the place where they know you as personal Savior, then God, I pray that today would be that day of salvation. That they would come and say, Pastor Darrell, I want to be saved. Or maybe others who want to unite with our church family. Or others who just want to come to the altar and they just want to pray and thank you for all you've done for them. Take the invitation. Use it for your glory and your honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.